I sat at the edge of my chair, the cold metal biting through the thin fabric of my uniform pants. The lights overhead buzzed faintly, casting a yellow glow over the assembled team. We were the best the agency could muster, though the term best felt increasingly hollow these days. Each of us bore scars, visible and invisible, from missions that had taken us to the brink and back. Captain John Harper stood at the front, his face a roadmap of old wounds. He didn't waste time with pleasantries. Ladies and gentlemen, he began, his voice rough as gravel. We've found something, an ancient alien portal on a distant planet. Coordinates have been locked. We don't know what's on the other side. He paused, letting that sink in. My heart pounded a little harder. Portals were bad news, unpredictable, dangerous. But they were also our best shot at finding resources and technology to keep our own crumbling world afloat. This is a one-way trip, Harper continued. We go through, we assess, we survive. We don't know if or when we'll be able to come back. If you're not up for it, now's the time to walk away. No one moved. We were all too far gone, too invested in this nightmare of a job, to back out now. Two days before the mission, we gathered for final preparations. I shared a bunk with Romero, a wiry engineer with a penchant for black humour. His tools were always pristine, his jokes always dark. You ever wonder, he said one night, lying in the cot above mine, if we're the last sane people. I mean... Who the hell signs up for this shit? People with nothing left to lose, I replied, staring at the metal slats of his bed. Or those who think they can make a difference. Yeah, he snorted. Difference? Sure. Romero had a point. We were a mixed bag of survivors and idealists, hardened by years of missions into the unknown. Some of us believed in a greater cause, others just needed the paycheck. The morning of the jump... The techs fitted us with suits designed for hostile environments. The fabric was heavy, laced with sensors and protective layers. It felt like putting on a second skin, one that chafed and pinched in all the wrong places. You ready for this, Daniels? Harper's voice cut through my thoughts. He was standing by the equipment lockers, arms folded over his chest. As ready as I'll ever be, I replied, checking the seals on my suit. What's our plan once we get there? Standard protocol, Harper said. Secure the area, establish a perimeter, and figure out what the hell we've stumbled into. The final briefing was held in a room filled with holographic displays. Images of the portal wavered on the walls, a swirling mass of energy anchored by alien technology. It was beautiful in a cold, deadly way. Dr. Evelyn Cross, our resident xenobiologist, stepped forward. She was one of the few who seemed genuinely excited about the mission. Her eyes sparkled with curiosity. The portal's energy signature matches nothing we've seen before, she explained, pointing to the data streams. It suggests an advanced civilization, potentially long gone, but we can't rule out the possibility of encountering hostile lifeforms. Stay vigilant. Stay alive, more like, muttered Bailey, our weapons specialist. He cradled his pulse rifle like a talisman, a grim look on his face. Remember, Harper said, his voice taking on a steely edge, we're stepping into the unknown. Keep your wits about you, trust your training, and watch each other's backs. No one goes off alone. We move as a unit, we fight as a unit, and if it comes to it, we die as a unit. The room fell silent. We were ready, or as ready as we could be. The portal awaited. A doorway to another world, another hell. The shuttle ride was rough. Turbulence shook us like dice in a cup as we descended through the planet's atmosphere. Outside the viewport, a barren, rocky landscape stretched out, jagged and inhospitable. The sky was a dull, oppressive grey, casting everything in a monochromatic gloom. We're coming up on the LZ, the pilot's voice came over the comm. Prepare for landing. The shuttle touched down with a thud. I unclipped my harness and stood. The ramp lowered, and we stepped out onto the alien soil. The air was thin and cold. The portal stood ahead, embedded in the side of a massive cliff. 
It shone with a green light, tendrils of energy snaking out and dissipating into the air. The technology around it was ancient, covered in symbols and partially buried by centuries of dust and rock. All right, team, Harper said. Form up, let's move. We advanced cautiously, weapons at the ready. The ground crunched under our boots, the sound unnaturally loud in the stillness. As we approached the portal, I could feel its energy thrumming in the air. Dr. Cross stepped forward. She scanned the portal with her equipment, muttering to herself as she interpreted the readings. It's stable, she said finally. As stable as it's going to get, we should be able to pass through safely. Should? Bailey muttered. That's comforting. Harper ignored him. On my mark, he said, his voice cutting through the tension. Three, two, one, go. We stepped through the portal and the world changed in an instant. I felt a nauseating twist in my gut, like being pulled apart and reassembled in a fraction of a second. My vision fogged, then cleared, revealing an alien landscape that baffled me. The ground was a mosaic of shifting sands and rock formations. The sky above was purple, streaked with yellow clouds. Eyes sharp, Harper commanded. Romero, Bailey, secure the perimeter. Cross, get your readings. Daniels, you're with me. I fell in step with Harper, my pulse rifle at the ready. The alien terrain was disorienting, a nightmare made real. Strange plants writhed and twitched as if they were aware of our presence. Captain, Cross called out. You're going to want to see this. We converged on her position. She was standing before a massive structure, half buried in the rocky ground. It resembled a spider's web, but each strand was a shimmering thread of energy. At the center of the web, a dark void seemed to suck in the surrounding light. What the hell is it? Bailey muttered, his grip tight on his rifle. Temporal weavers, Cross said. They manipulate time and space. This web, it's controlling the flow of reality here. Can we communicate with them? Harper asked. Cross shook her head. I don't know, but we need to be careful. Disrupting their web could have catastrophic consequences. We spread out, forming a defensive perimeter around the web. Romero was on his knees, examining one of the threads with a scanner. These things are alive, he said, his voice trembling slightly. Stay back, Harper ordered. As if in response, the threads began to vibrate, emitting a high-pitched sound. From the void at the center of the web, shapes began to emerge. Spider-like creatures, their bodies shimmering with the same energy as the web. Hold your fire, Harper barked. We don't want to provoke them. The weavers advanced slowly, their legs weaving intricate patterns in the air. One of them stopped in front of me, its gaze fixed on my face. I felt a strange sensation as if time itself was stretching and contracting around me. My mind struggled to process the alien presence. What do you want? I whispered though I knew it couldn't understand me. The weaver tilted its head, then reached out with one of its legs. I flinched, expecting an attack, but it merely touched my chest, right above my heart. I felt a jolt, like an electric shock, and suddenly, memories flooded my mind. Flashes of my past, my fears, my regrets. The weaver was probing my very soul. Daniels, are you all right? Harper's voice cut through the haze. I, I think so. I said, my voice shaky. It's inside my head. We need to find a way to communicate, Cross said, her eyes wide with fascination. As Cross worked on her equipment, the rest of us kept a wary eye on the weavers. They seemed to be observing us just as intently, their movements a strange dance of curiosity and caution. But something felt off. Captain, we're picking up some kind of seismic activity, Romero reported his eyes glued to his scanner. It's getting stronger. Everyone, back away from the web, Harper ordered. Something's happening. Before we could react, a sudden quake knocked us off our feet. The web shuddered violently, its threads snapping and recoiling like whips. The weavers screeched, a sound that pierced through my skull and chaos erupted. One of the threads lashed out, striking Bailey and sending him flying. His scream was cut short as his body convulsed, trapped in a temporal flux. 
I scrambled to my feet, firing at the rogue thread, but my bullets seemed to slow mid-air, warping and twisting as they approached the web. Daniels, get Bailey out of there, Harper commanded, firing his own weapon at the approaching weavers. I rushed forward, grabbing Bailey by his collar and dragging him away from the web. His body was shaking uncontrollably, his eyes wide with terror. The weavers were in a frenzy, their movements disjointed. Romero, how do we stop this? I asked. I don't know, Romero shouted back. We need to stabilize the web, but I don't know how. Figure it out, fast, Harper said, continuing to fire at the advancing weavers. With Bailey convulsing in my arms, I felt the full weight of our situation. We were meddling with forces beyond our understanding, and the price of failure was steep. Romero was working, trying to find a solution. Cross, can you interface with the web? Harper demanded, his voice strained. I'm trying, Cross shouted, her face drawn. The weavers are disrupting the temporal balance. We need to stabilize it before it collapses completely. I looked at Bailey, his body twitching with every pulse of the web. We couldn't let this happen. Not now. Not like this. Harper, cover me, I said, setting Bailey down gently. I'm going in. I sprinted towards the web, dodging the flailing threads. The weavers turned their attention to me. I felt a surge of fear, but I pushed it down, focusing on the task at hand. Romero, what do I do? I shouted. Get to the center, Romero replied. There's a control node. If you can interface with it, you might be able to stabilize the web. I fought my way through the thrashing threads, each step a battle against the forces of time and space. My skin tingled with the energy radiating from the web, and I could feel reality itself warping around me. Finally, I reached the center. The control node was a mass of energy, its surface shifting and changing in a constant flux. I reached out, my fingers brushing against the node, and a jolt of electricity shot through me. Daniels, can you hear me? Romero's voice echoed in my mind. I can hear you, I replied, my voice strained. What do I do? Focus on the node. Romero instructed. You need to sync your thoughts with it. Stabilize the flow of time. You can do this. I closed my eyes, forcing myself to concentrate. I felt the node's energy flowing through me, a torrent of raw power. I focused on the threads, visualizing them as strands of time, weaving them back together in my mind. The ground beneath the alien structure trembled. A section of the rock shifted and split apart revealing a hidden chamber below. Dust and ancient air rushed out, carrying a strange scent. What the hell? Romero muttered. Did we just trigger something? It looks like it, Cross replied. Harper motioned for us to proceed. Let's go, we might find some answers on how to fix this. We descended cautiously, our lights cutting through the darkness. At the far end of the chamber, an array of alien artifacts lay arranged on a stone altar. Cross moved forward. These artifacts, they're ancient, far older than anything we've seen before. Bailey, still recovering but stable, leaned heavily on Romero as they followed us. Harper and I took defensive positions, keeping an eye on the entrance and the surrounding shadows. Cross examined the artifacts. These writings, they're a form of prophecy. It speaks of a group arriving through the portal, disrupting the balance, and a catastrophic event that follows. I felt a cold chill run down my spine. You mean us? Yes, Cross said. Our arrival was foreseen. Can you decipher it? Harper asked, his tone urgent. I'm working on it, Cross replied, her eyes scanning the alien text. The prophecy is fragmented, but it seems to suggest that we have a role to play in preventing the catastrophe. Romero set Bailey down gently, his face strained. We don't have much time. If the weavers turn hostile again, we won't survive another encounter. Cross continued to piece together the fragments of the prophecy. It mentions a key, something that can stabilize or destroy the web entirely. If we find this key, we might be able to control the flow of time here, maybe even reverse the damage we caused. Where do we find this key? I asked, the tension in my voice matching the tightness in my chest. Cross pointed to a section of the wall. It's hidden somewhere on this planet, guarded by the weavers, 
we need to venture deeper into their territory to retrieve it. Harper nodded. All right, team. We move out in ten. Romero, see if you can get Bailey mobile. Let's get a lay of the land and find the safest route. We exited the chamber. The alien landscape outside seemed even more hostile, as if aware of our intentions. The weavers had withdrawn, but their presence lingered. Romero rigged a brace for Bailey, who grimaced but managed to stand. I'll be fine, Bailey said through gritted teeth. Just get me a target. Cross had translated enough of the prophecy to guide us. We need to head north towards the mountain range. That's where the key is likely hidden. We moved as a unit, every step measured. The terrain grew rougher, the twisted plants more aggressive, as if the planet itself was resisting our progress. The sky darkened, a storm brewing on the horizon. As we trekked, strange temporal distortions began to appear. Moments where time seemed to slow down, then snap back violently. The sensation was disorienting, a reminder of the weaver's power over this place. The first distortion hit us like a wave. One moment I was trudging through the rocky terrain, the next I was standing in my childhood home. The familiar scent of my mother's cooking filled the air, and I could hear the distant sound of my father's voice calling me for dinner. I blinked, trying to shake off the hallucination, but it clung to me like a persistent dream. Daniels, snap out of it! Harper's voice cut through the illusion, and I found myself back on the alien planet, the sky still purple. Romero wasn't as lucky. He stood frozen, staring into space with a look of sheer terror on his face. Romero, what do you see? I asked, gripping his shoulder. My daughter, he whispered. She's crying. She's alone. I can't... His voice broke, and I shook him harder. Romero, it's not real. Focus on here. On now. He blinked rapidly, the vision fading. Right, right, just a hallucination. The next distortion was worse. I saw my own death, an older version of myself lying in a hospital bed, tubes and wires snaking into my body, the beeping of machines, the smell of the room. I felt the pain, the fear of the end approaching. It was so real, so immediate I could hardly breathe. Daniels, keep moving. Harper's command was urgent, snapping me back to the present. Bailey dropped to his knees, his hands clawing at his face. I'm old, he gasped. I can feel my bones breaking, my skin wrinkling. I can't, I can't move. Cross knelt beside him, her voice soothing. Bailey, listen to me. It's the distortions. They're messing with our perceptions. Focus on my voice. You're here, with us. Slowly, Bailey calmed his breathing evening out. We helped him to his feet, but the look in his eyes told me he wasn't entirely back. We have to keep moving, Harper said. These distortions are getting worse. We moved on, the distortions hitting us in waves. Each one left us more shaken, more uncertain of our reality. The weaver's influence was strong here, bending time and space to their will. We saw fragments of our pasts, glimpses of possible futures, all interwoven with the stark alien landscape around us. We finally reached the foot of the mountains. A massive cave yawned ahead, its entrance flanked by more of the web-like structures. We entered the cave, our lights revealing more alien symbols. As we moved deeper, the cave opened into a vast space dominated by a massive altar at its center. On the altar, encased in a field of energy, was the key. It was a small key, glowing with a blue light. That's it, Cross breathed. That's the key. Before we could react, the weavers appeared, emerging from the shadows. One of them stepped forward, its legs weaving patterns in the air. The others formed a circle around us, their gazes fixed on the key. The weaver in front of me reached out, a single leg extending towards my chest. I tensed, but it stopped just short, its touch almost gentle. A flood of images and sensations invaded my mind. Memories of my childhood, visions of a possible future, and the overwhelming presence of the weaver's consciousness. They're communicating, Cross whispered, her voice trembling with awe. They're showing us what the key is for. 
The weaver conveyed its message in fragmented bursts. The key was a powerful artifact, but it required a living host to function. The host would gain immense power, but the risk was great. The bond would be permanent, the host forever tied to the web of time and space. Harper's face was grim as he processed the information. So one of us has to bond with this thing. Any volunteers? The weavers watched, their eyes unblinking, waiting. I'll do it, I said, stepping forward before I could second-guess myself. The weaver's eyes locked onto mine. Daniels, you don't have to... Harper began, but I cut him off. We don't have time to argue. We need to stabilize the web, or everything falls apart. The weaver extended its leg again, touching my chest. This time the connection was deeper, more intense. I felt the key's energy merging with my own, a burning sensation spreading through my veins. I was plunged into a sea of memories, both mine and alien. I saw the weaver's origins, their purpose as guardians of time, and the delicate balance they maintained. I felt their pain, their struggle against entropy, and their need for a symbiotic host to preserve the web. My body convulsed, my muscles straining against the overwhelming energy coursing through me. I could hear Harper and the others shouting, but their voices were distant, muffled. I was alone in this struggle, my consciousness merging with the alien presence. Slowly, the chaos in my mind began to settle. The key's energy became a part of me, a constant presence at the core of my being. I could feel the web of time, its threads stretching out into infinity, each one a possible future or a fragment of the past. I opened my eyes, my vision clearing. The weavers stood around me, their eyes filled with relief and curiosity. I could sense their approval, their acceptance of me as the new host. Daniels, can you hear me? Harper's voice broke through the haze. I'm here, I replied. I, I can feel it. The web, it's, it's part of me now. Cross knelt beside me. Incredible! You're bonded with the key. You can stabilize the web. The weavers guided me to the center, where the threads of the web converged. I could feel the fragile balance that needed to be maintained. I reached out and touched the threads of the web. The energy surged through me and I felt my mind expand, connecting with the temporal fabric. I could see the disruptions we had caused, the fractures in the flow of time. I concentrated, willing the threads to mend to weave back together. The energy responded, the threads glowing brighter as they reconnected. The weavers moved around me, their presence a steadying force, guiding me through the process. It felt like hours, but it was probably only minutes. Slowly the web stabilized, the distortions fading. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding my body sagging with exhaustion. The web is stable, I whispered. Harper stepped forward, his face filled with relief and pride. Good job, Daniels. Let's get you out of here. The weavers retreated, their eyes still watching us but with less intensity. I could feel their gratitude, their relief at the web's stabilization. But I also felt their expectation. The bond was permanent, and my role as the stabilizer of the web was just beginning. We made our way out of the cave, the alien landscape greeting us once more. How do you feel? Cross asked, her eyes scanning me for any signs of distress. Different, I admitted. Like I'm connected to everything, it's overwhelming. We'll figure this out, Harper said, clapping a hand on my shoulder, one step at a time. Before we could move, the air around us warped. Tall, imposing figures materialized, their forms shifting between light and shadow. The temporal guardians had arrived. They radiated an aura of both majesty and menace, their presence heavy with power. One of the guardians stepped forward, its eyes like black holes that seemed to draw in the light. It extended a hand towards me, and I felt a surge of energy, a connection that rooted me to the spot. Images flooded my mind again. This time, visions of trials, of darkness, and of choices that tore at the soul. The Guardian's voice resonated within my head, a deep sound that felt like it came from the core of the planet. To prove your worthiness, 
you must face your darkest moments, altered to test your resolve. Fail, and your existence will be erased. The ground beneath us shifted, the alien landscape dissolving into a swirling vortex. When the world settled, we were no longer in the cave. Each of us stood alone, isolated in a realm of our own nightmares. I found myself back in the dusty, war-torn streets of a forgotten battlefield, the smell of smoke and blood in the air. This was the place where I had lost everything. My comrades, my sanity, my soul. I moved through the wreckage, the sounds of gunfire and screams all too real. Suddenly I saw my squad, pinned down by enemy fire. But something was wrong. Their faces were distorted, twisted by pain and betrayal. Daniels! You left us! One of them screamed, his voice a raw wound. You abandoned us to save yourself! The truth hit me. I had made a choice back then, a choice to survive at the cost of my brothers. It was a decision that had haunted me every day since. Now I was reliving it, but the stakes were higher. I felt the weight of the rifle in my hands, the same one I had used to fight my way out. But this time, the battlefield shifted. The enemies were not faceless soldiers, but twisted versions of my squad, their eyes filled with accusation. Fight them or save us. A voice whispered in my ear, cold and indifferent. Prove your worth. I hesitated, my mind torn. Every instinct screamed to fight, to survive. But I knew that was the wrong choice. It had been the wrong choice then, and it was the wrong choice now. With a deep breath, I lowered my weapon and stepped forward, arms raised. I'm sorry, I said, my voice cracking. I should have stayed. I should have fought with you. The twisted faces of my squad seemed to soften, the anger and pain fading. The scene around me dissolved, the battlefield vanishing into darkness. One by one the others emerged from their own nightmares, each of them changed in some way. The Guardians reappeared, their forms solidifying out of the shadows. The lead Guardian approached me, its gaze piercing into my soul. You have passed the trial. The bond is strengthened. Use the power wisely. As the words settled into my mind, I felt a deeper connection with the web, the threads of time and space intertwining with my essence. The realization struck me with a force that took my breath away. I was no longer just a man with the key. I was the key. You are now the unyielding guardian, the lead guardian intoned. Your fate is bound to this place. You cannot leave. You must remain here to maintain the balance and protect the web. The weight of their words sank in, a crushing burden that pressed down on my chest. My world spun, and I staggered, barely keeping my footing. What? No, there has to be another way, I pleaded, my voice breaking. I can't stay here forever. The guardians remained unmoved, their expressions inscrutable. This is your destiny. I turned to look at my team, my friends. Harper's stern face softened for a moment, a rare crack in his usual stoic demeanor. Romero, his dark eyes filled with sorrow, clenched his jaw. Cross seemed lost, her scientific curiosity battling with the human connection we had formed. Bailey, still pale and shaken, stared at me with fear and respect. No, this can't be it, I whispered, my voice trembling. I can't stay here. I have a life back home. We have a mission to complete together. Harper's face tightened, the strain of leadership and friendship evident. Daniels, I know this is hard, but if what they say is true, you have to stay. The web needs you. Romero stepped forward. Daniels, we can't just leave you here. There has to be another way. There isn't, I said, shaking my head. You heard them. This is my fate now. Tears welled in Cross's eyes, her voice breaking. This isn't fair. You don't deserve this. Bailey looked like he wanted to argue, but he just shook his head, defeated. You're a hero, man. A damn hero. The team gathered their gear, the atmosphere heavy with the weight of our parting. The Guardians watched in silent vigil. I watched as they walked back towards the portal, each step taking them further from me and deeper into their mission. 
The portal shimmered with green light, the doorway back to their world now closed to me. As they disappeared through the portal, the full weight of my isolation hit me. I was alone in a hostile world, bound to a task that would consume the rest of my existence. I fell to my knees, the reality crashing down on me. I screamed, a sound that rang through the cavern, but there was no one to hear. The guardians surrounded me, their eyes reflecting the infinite expanse of time and space. You are the unyielding guardian, the lead guardian said. Your task is to maintain the balance to protect the web from those who would harm it. You will face challenges both from within and without. But you are not alone. We are with you. I nodded, accepting my fate. I took my place at the center of the web, the threads wrapping around me like a protective cocoon. The guardians faded into the shadows, their presence always felt but rarely seen. Days, months and years blurred together in a constant stream of vigilance. The web was fragile, its balance delicate. Each thread represented a moment in time, a potential future or a forgotten past. I could feel their significance, their weight as I maintained the intricate weave. Challenges came as the Guardians had warned. Temporal anomalies, hostile creatures and even incursions from other dimensions. I faced them all, the power of the key guiding me. In the quiet moments, when the web was stable and the world outside was still, I thought of my team. I wondered what they were doing, if they had managed to warn Earth, if they remembered me. The bond I shared with them, forged in the trials we faced together, was a constant source of strength. The Guardians appeared occasionally, their presence a silent reminder of my duty. They offered guidance, wisdom and sometimes cryptic warnings about future challenges. But they also respected my solitude, understanding the burden I carried. As the unyielding Guardian, I was a part of the web a living embodiment of its power and its fragility. My existence was a struggle, a never-ending battle to maintain the balance.